Wax Tools. I'm Tom. So we'll get a little update and announcements for uh, the Baby Bullet. Um, and uh, those of you guys that followed this project and uh, supported uh, uh, me with comments and encouragement, thank you very much. A um, couple things. This thing's going to take a little road trip around the country. And uh, first stop is uh, Detroit, Michigan um, later this month. And it's going to go uh, to um, Pete Ferguson. Uh, and he's a guy that made the actual uh, lead screw for this. Uh, he's a viewer, longtime viewer, and uh, he wanted to help out with the project. So he made, uh, he made a screw and sent it in. And that's the screw that's in here. So Pete, thanks a lot for that. And he's got a uh, kind of a model engineering club uh, that we're hoping uh, Don Bailey's actually going to show up to later this month. And uh, I'll put some links in the description for you guys. And uh, he's going to show this there. And then after that, uh, it's going to go over to NYC CNC uh, for, his op uh, for John Saunders' open house. And that's on uh, April 30th in Zanesville, Ohio. I think that's a Saturday. Uh, so the vice will be there on display and you guys can check it out and uh, twirl the handle in person if you're in that area. So uh, that'll be kind of fun. And then after that we'll see uh, uh, some other YouTube creators uh, would like to host it and drum up a little bit of interest for the cause. And just as a reminder, the cause is uh, supporting vocational education. So we're going to, we're collecting donations uh, with a GoFundMe campaign and uh, the auction proceeds when we auction the vice off uh, will go to some uh, deserving uh, vocational ed program that needs a machine or needs tooling or materials or whatever they need. Uh, we'll decide, uh, um, you know, what, uh, what program gets that. So we haven't decided yet and the auction hasn't started yet. So in addition to that, what... Uh, um, I got a lot of questions about some of the uh, methodologies and, uh, and why I did it, uh, certain things in the build one way or the other. And uh, so there was enough questions that it's probably worth doing a question and answer. So without further yappage, uh, we'll cruise over and uh, look at my list of questions and uh, we'll take a look at the vice and um, answer some questions that folks had. So there were some good questions. So let's go check that out. All right. So I got a little list of questions here, and uh, let's just go through. Let me. Uh, I'm going to take this moving jaw out real quick. Let's whip this out here. And then this is that lead screw I was telling you about that uh, Pete Ferguson made there. It's going to say Acme thread. Um, so the first one was, uh, you know, I got a lot of questions about this bore on this thing and why I did it in the four jaw as opposed to mounting it to an angle plate in the mill and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I wanted to ream it for starters, okay? And the reason was that uh, I had already established a, a bore of axis of some sort through there, okay? And one thing that reamers do is they tend to um, and you probably even notice this in the video is they tend to follow what's already there okay and so it has an averaging effect on um, on whatever run out is there now if I run a if I run a boring bar a single point boring bar through there which is what would have happened if I would have done it in the mill okay um, you tend to make the hole bigger uh, than you would by just reaming it and letting the reamer follow the uh, the, the hole that's already there and why didn't I ream it in the mill? Because I couldn't get a number four Morse taper in the, uh, in the milling machine. And I don't think uh, Adam would have appreciated me uh, turning down the shank on his, uh, on his nice reamer that he loaned me, okay? So anyway, those are the kind of the reasons on that. Um, and in retrospect, um, I could have avoided some of those problems uh, by leaving more meat on the bore. There was more weld distortion than I kind of anticipated and you might even be able to see some of it in there um, in, in the bore okay so I should have left more meat on that and then uh, and then gone in there and uh, um, just bored it to the true diameter at that point and so you know I left another you know two or three millimeters in there or something like that that would have probably done it so uh, so in retrospect, I probably would have changed that order of operations there to uh, on that particular thing. Okay, 
Um, I got a lot of questions about, uh, you know, why didn't you use more power tools? And, um, you know, I, re I really wanted the project to be accessible to, to anybody um, with just basic tools, okay? So we didn't use anything that was really fancy here, okay? Sure, we used a lathe and a mill, we used a lot of hand files, and, uh, and you know, that's about it. We didn't use any trick tooling or CNC's or anything like that that, uh, um, you know, the modest uh, home shop doesn't have. So in reality, you don't need a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to do that, uh, this kind of work if you just have uh, some patience and uh, some stick to itness uh, to do it. So, okay, so let's, uh, next question is uh, about the files and abrasives that I use. So let's go over and uh, look at the different files that I used on, uh, on some of these operations. All right, so here's, these are, these are the main files that I used uh, uh, when I was doing the file work on the, on the baby bullet. Um, we'll just kind of go through them here. So, you, you know, you get your basic round, round files here. You know, some people call these rat tail files because they kind of look like rat tails. Uh, I got a couple different sizes here. Now, this is a, uh, uh, I believe this is a chainsaw file here. Uh, it's, what is that, uh, 532 diameter, um, you know, four millimeters or something like that. And, uh, um, and what differs, between a regular uh, round file and a chainsaw file, this is the same diameter all the way down. These tend to, they taper, okay? Um, so those, those are round files. This is a half round file. Uh, I didn't use this one a ton, but uh, I must have used it for a few things because it's out and, uh, um, you know, it's here with all the other stuff. Um, then, uh, we get into, uh, these are the, uh, this is a Swiss pattern file here, okay? Um, and this is a, it's a half round, but the Swiss pattern uh, half rounds have a more uh, pronounced taper to them, okay? Uh, then I, let's see, do I have a regular? Mm, oh yeah, here's one. Now this is a, this is an American pattern uh, half round here, and you can see it's parallel here, right? Okay, and this one, uh, this one tapers, which is nice because you the radius is changing too a little bit, so you can get into different areas that you can't get into back here. So I didn't really use that one. So we'll set that one aside. So that's a uh, half round uh, Swiss pattern, and this one's a number two cut. This is the uh, the finer of the two. You can see the difference there. Okay, and this one's a uh, double lot. Okay, double lot, and this one's a, a two. Okay, and this one's a let's see, is that Nicholson? Um, I mean, uh, yeah, this is Nicholson. So they're probably both Nicholson, but they they're Swiss pattern. So uh, anyway, there's those two guys, and then um, these are a couple of of uh, ones that I used a lot. Uh, and then these are crossing files here, and the clockmakers use these for cutting the openings in gears and whatnot for, they call it crossing out. Um, and they're two different, uh, um, I, I want to say grits, but that isn't, the two different cuts. And grit isn't really the right word, but uh, um, of course they're not marked, they're not marked, uh, you know, you're supposed to memorize all this stuff. So we got a fine and a pretty coarse one here. That one needs to be clean there. It's it's pinned out. It's got a, a bunch of junk in it. So, okay. Uh, and those were very, very useful there because, once again, the, they taper and there's a different, there's a, uh, the curvature is different on either side of it, too. So that makes it very, very uh, versatile in a lot of different areas of those all those compound curves. Um, little... Um, uh, little rifflers, okay, die makers rifflers, these are Nicholson. Uh, this particular one I used, uh, I, I think, almost exclusively, okay. Uh, and and I, I, you know what, I don't know what they call that one. I broke, I broke this one. <laughs> I broke the other end here. I was pushing on it too hard and twink, it just came off. Um, now this is a abrasive uh, stick here. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, doesn't want to really. anyway it's got a sleeve that locks it in there this one's pretty tight I need to I need to uh, knock it oh, let's see if I can do that there we go 
um, and it just holds an abrasive stick, so you can kind of you can kind of choke up on it. Of course, it won't go back in. Uh, I'm trying to get it back in, so you can choke up on it and uh, um, make it nice and stiff, or reach into an area. And these are kind of neat because you can reshape them to get into a different area. So uh, that worked pretty good. And uh, this is a mill file here. This is a Ferd. P-F-R-E-D, uh, same as the name on the handle. Um, and this is just a, uh, it's a flat or a mill file, okay. I think that's a, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a mill file. Okay, I'm not positive. Um, and uh, this is the my favorite handle. This is, it's kind of soft. And this is made by P-F-E-R-D, -F -F -E Ferd. Uh, and I believe they're German, and it's got the little horsey on there, okay, um, or whatever that is. I think it's a horse. And uh, these handles are awesome. Uh, they're, um, and these are furred handles too, but these are even better. So uh, I got a couple of those. And then there's this Nicholson uh, Magic Cut that uh, that I've been using, and it has a safe edge on it too, uh, partially. So I use that. Uh, when I got it, somebody had modified the tip there. Okay, so that's that. And then um, just uh, emery paper here, okay, like that. And that's, uh, I don't know, 180 grit there. And then I use the sanding block for some of it too because you can put a little more pressure with that, okay. So that's the uh, that's kind of the files I used on it and, uh, and then a, a lot of that. So uh, I got a mark on my head because I was wearing that so long. <laughs> All right, so the next question uh, on this was, um, actually, a lot of people ask this is, how many hours you got in this thing? And, um, you know, I have a number in my head, and, uh, and, and I think back, and uh, I probably should have logged the hours a little bit better, but, I, you know, I wasn't doing it to, uh, to see how long it took, you know, I was doing it because I was having fun. And I chose some of the methods, not because they're easy, but because they're hard, and, uh, you know, physically. And it's what I like to do in the shop, and uh, for me, this is kind of my relaxing time to be out in the shop, so uh, I don't really think about time too much out here, okay? <laughs> Unless things aren't going very well. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so my estimate is, uh, as to all the time that I spend in this is roughly 100 hours, okay? Um, which is a pretty, you know, so if you look at all the videos, there's 24 videos, and, uh, you know, they're half hour piece, something like that. So uh, obviously I didn't film every single minute of it and uh, some things I did off camera. So fine, double all that. So uh, that's, um, um, so 30 minutes, so say it's 30 hours there, right? There was some design work and then uh, the off camera stuff. So, you know, I can, uh, I could say it was roughly a hundred hours. Okay, um, you know, just kind of rough estimation. And if you think about it, you know, if you started and that's all you were working on eight hours a day uh, and you started on, on a Monday, you know, would you have it done in two and a half weeks? And then my answer is, yeah, you would. And, uh, you know, you, you'd have had enough by then. But, uh, you know, if it was your job, your day job, uh, um, you could bang it out. OK, so so what's it worth? I don't know. You know, we're going to find out. And, uh, you know, if you, you multiply that 100 hours by uh, uh, some reasonable wage you can uh, kind of come up with a number, you know, and uh, I'm not going to throw any numbers out, but uh, uh, you know $50 an hour or whatever would not be unreasonable right for a, a shop rate and it could be as high as a hundred dollars an hour, right? So uh, um, You know, there's there's some range there obviously and um, you know we're going to sell this and, uh, and don donate the proceeds to charity and I can tell you that I've gotten a couple of emails with some pretty generous offers for this thing that actually shocked me so uh, um, you know we'll, we'll see what happens when, uh, when we auction this thing okay so anyway that's it 100 hours and uh, you know 100 and well actually two three hundred dollars in materials roughly something like that and most of that's in this this base, I didn't want to make the base, so I just bought a, a brand new one here from Wilton. And by the way, we're still trying to find somebody from Wilton to pay attention to this thing, so uh, uh, nobody, that, nobody seems to be paying attention from Wilton. So uh, if you know anybody at Wilton, uh, rattle their cage, okay? <laughs> All right, so there they are next to each other. 
Um, the next question, uh, you know, a lot of people said, gee, you know, some of these methods that you're using, this hand filing and all this hand work, is this so slow, you know? And so that was actually a pretty common uh, sentiment and uh, a comment. And the, you know, for, for really fine hand work, okay, uh, very careful hand work, sometimes power tools are not your friend, okay? Um, it takes a, just a split second for a power tool to get out of your control and, uh, and cause a problem. So uh, if you want the kind of the ultimate in control, and um, you know, hand work is really the best. Now, certainly, you could uh, you could do a lot of the roughing work and and things like that. And you know what? I just chose to do most of this by hand. Okay. And uh, um, you know, there was a a couple little areas down in here where I used a little Dremel just because I did. You know, and um, um, and you know what? There's a little mark down there that I don't really care for either. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I see it, it's a tiny little mark, but it, uh, you know, it's still there, right? And, um, but, uh, so I kind of decided that I really kind of wanted to do a lot of hand work on it. And, and you know what, and I had a lot of fun, so, but I encourage people to use the methods that they're most comfortable with. And uh, if power tools, and if you're really, you know, if you're good with a little four inch grinder and good with a die grinder and whatnot, that's wonderful, right? Um, but I think everybody's had a uh, uh, or seen a, a horror story uh, with a power tool uh, on something that was really nice at one point. So uh, it's pretty easy to uh, for the thing to get away from you. Okay, even even in inexperienced hands, right? You're sanding over here, and the back edge of the disc is grinding away over here, and you didn't notice it, and, and now you're like, oh crap! So you got to weld that up and do something with that too. So uh, and they just don't reach in some of these areas as well. So. Okay. So anyway, that was the uh, that was uh, an answer to that one, um, and I must have got a million uh, uh, comments on the uh, the key uh, before welding the jaw on. And to me, that was kind of a trivial decision. Uh, um, it was very easy to orient this. Um, I had the jaw off, and I just dropped it. You know, I welded it on, and I dropped it onto a parallel like that, and bango! Now I'm instantly light. Um, parallel and uh, and perpendicular to the to the key, so uh, it was kind of a trivial decision to 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 the key after welding the jaw on there. So I got a ton of comments on that one. So uh, uh, and then you know there's uh, um, it was easier to position the key as well after any weld distortion from all the all the welding from that too. So. Uh, um, you know, it's kind of after weld distortion. So whatever happened, happened, and now I put the key in and it's accurately aligned with the jaw. And I think you guys saw that, uh, you know, it lines up pretty good. So um, we're, not, uh, we're not stressing over that. Okay, so that was that one. All right, that's about it. Um, we're gonna pack these up and, uh, and put them to bed. I got a, um, a Pelican case here that, uh, uh, didn't have anything in it. There was an old camera case, and uh, that's going to be our our transport case for these little guys. And these are going to go uh, out on tour uh, around the country and uh, do a little uh, promotional tour. So first stop is uh, is uh, Detroit, and uh, then off to Ohio, and then from there I'm not sure. So uh, anyway, guys, thanks for watching. And if you like this kind of content and uh, this kind of build, uh, please subscribe. It helps me. And um, once again, check out the links uh, for the GoFundMe campaign. And if you can kick a couple of bucks in, it is very much appreciated. So thanks for watching.